Hello. Uh, everyone on that table already knows me, but I'm Dan Lowe, for those who don't. Uh, I'm a professional prop maker and special effects artist. I kind of know what I'm talking about, ish. Um, I've worked on a few movies. That horrible Ghost in the Shell one with Scarlett Johansson. The props were amazing, the rest of it was not. <laughs> that was the one good bit of the movie, I promise. Um, Power Rangers, the live action, again, similar ish problem. Um, and quite a few Netflix series and things like that. So if you've got any questions about stuff that isn't noobish, come to me. So basically, what I'm going to go through is mainly foam based props today because it's the most beginner friendly style of props and you can do it at home, you don't really need too many specialty items to be able to do it. And also, when you bring them to a convention, it's con safe and you can't really hurt anyone with them. Well, I mean, if you really try, you can. Except with the pom. <laughs> Safety! Be safe. Yes. Yes. Hypocritical, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is hypocritical. Don't ask me about the giant scar on the back of my hand. Um, so basically, all of the stuff that we're going to be using here is relatively easy to keep yourself safe with. The most dangerous thing we're dealing with is one of these, which is a nice big scalpel. Um, if you've not used one of these before, these are your friends. But also, they're not friends to your fingers, and you've got a tendency to like catch yourself on this little nib bit here. So, yes, I know, but they're also so good at cutting everything else. I'm gonna take my wig off. I'm really sorry, guys. I'll have some water there for you. Thank you. So you can, you get a bit more me. Stay hydrated, people. Yeah. And enjoy and, and enjoy yourself the gin and tonic gummies. Is that what they are? That's what they are. Okay, they're, they're for him for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, Immediately everyone dies in. <laughs> oh my god, those... Mm -mm. Cool. Uh, one of the other things that I would recommend that you guys get, if you don't have already, but you're looking to make props as a nice little respirator, you can just get like one of the plasterers ones, which is like a, a one that you'd wear for coronavirus, I guess. Um, so, you know, it, doubles up as being doubly safe at this particular point in time. Um, but just, <laughs> no, just about the mask, okay? Mm -hmm. So I know that you get specific filters for these, but is there like a certain type you're looking for or just things like contact adhesive? Uh, for contact adhesive, usually just the general one's fine. Um, because the amounts that you're going to be using contact adhesive, it's not going to make a huge amount of difference. If, it, if, it, if you're doing like uh, prop making all day like this, then get a proper respirator with the right plugins. But for the most part, if you're in a relatively well ventilated area, just having a normal mask is absolutely fine. Um, the only thing you obviously will notice is the smell, because um, contact is the one that I use most for phones. It's really, really good. Um, I'll go through. I'm, I'm very, very in love with glue, so um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get that round later, I promise. But basically, if you're looking to also get rid of the smell, one of the things you can do is get a vacuum cleaner in your workspace, and that will take most of the fume stuff away um, and just every time you use a little bit blast the vacuum cleaner for a couple of seconds um, waft whatever you're working on out the window you know. same way you'd waft a fart um, <laughs> and yeah that's the way you can generally stay safe and keep all of your fumes going in the correct direction all good fans are also really good set up your fans so it points out the window um, the opposite side of your workspace so window here fan there working here okay. all the fumes will out your window so that generally, in that scenario, I wouldn't even wear a mask for that, but do it anyway to be safe. <laughs> Don't be me. <laughs> um, armatures! Cool! Everyone know what armatures and, and um, structure is in a prop? Yeah? Kind of? No? Not really. Cool. Uh, so when I'm referring to structure, I'm talking about the thing that supports your prop. So this in this particular dagger here is a fiberglass rod. All the weapons that are on your tables are fiberglass or carbon fibre. Um, these are all stunt safe weaponry, so you could use these on a film set to hit someone with and it wouldn't hurt, for instance. Um, but for cosplay basis, you can use most anything as long as it doesn't break. So try and avoid stuff like thin wooden dowel if you can, because that stuff snaps and it's a pain in the ass and pretty hot wrecking whenever it breaks. Um, try and avoid uh, things like bamboo, because they splinter and they're just a bit of a nightmare to work with and you need like clipping saw tools and things like that. Um, so generally, if I was doing an outdoor thing I'd recommend for cosplayers is PVC pipe. Super easy to cut, you can get a specialty pipe cutting tool to actually go through it really, really easily. Come on in, come on in, so whatever you like. Um, so 
that means that you can then build your prop around something that's still flexible and that will be con safe because it's bendy and it will break before a person does. So, safety! And also a really cool prop. Do you want to sit down? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> so, generally, when I'm building a LARP safe weapon, it will always be carbon fibre or fiberglass. And the beauty with that, in fact, actually, the axe is one of the things that's really good to show this, is that you can really, really abuse this stuff and it absolutely will not break under any circumstances. So, if you want a really, really hard wearing prop that you can actually do some stunt safe stuff with, that one's not got a core, has it? This one? Yeah. Yeah, that's got a core. Oh, it's got a core. This oh, one's cool. fiberglass core. I made all of these myself. You definitely nice. know if it didn't have a yeah, core. Yeah. Yeah. This one doesn't have a core, yeah. so if you want to play with that one... <laughs> I'll track that one for you. So that one's completely safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got me. <laughs> Dead! <laughs> yeah, so that one's completely safe to throw at people, the ones with cores... Not really. Um, these ones here, if, please don't try and hit someone with them because these are not stunt safe. I've made the core so it was too close to the edge oh. of the foam. Um, so if I do hand these around, please don't hit anyone with them. Thank you. <laughs> um, so as it says up here, like there's loads and loads of different um, methods you can use. I would steer away from metal pipe as being the core uh, piece because that hurts. Uh, and also it has a tendency to not like glue very much. I'll go through why it doesn't like glue later. Um, then flexible props, one of the things that a lot of people don't realise is that you can do cores for flexible props so you can actually use like a glue stick. Mm -hmm. So if you want to put some weight in it, for instance if you do like throwing axes and you want to lob them at people but you still want a nice axy weight to it, stick a glue stick in the middle of it. Throwing knives. Throwing knives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we made throwing bananas last year and just heated he those into a curved shape and that was the core for the... That sounds they glorious. Great. They were great. Death by banana! <laughs> um, yeah. So again, oh, I'm doing a great thing, thing for this year. Um, if you're looking to make foam armour or armour plate of any kind, you want to start thinking about how you're going to structure your armour onto your body, so how it attaches, before you even start building. Because you'll find that you'll build the thing and then think, ah, now I've got to stick a rivet in it and it's not going to look as pretty because I didn't think about how I was laminating all of the slides together. So there's still structure even in armour plate, or even in your armour basis. Okay? Sleeves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so effectively what you're looking at is trying to um, create something for the other thing to sit on. So if you're looking at armour, make sure you've got a body template ready to go, and by body template, does, is everyone familiar with pattern making in here? Or the art of making something in like a paper format and then... They might make me cry a bit, but yes. <laughs> I'm not saying we're good at it. <laughs> it it's, it's actually a really, really difficult art, because you're, you're effectively turning something from 2D to 3D, right? It's hard, it's really hard. Even the best people in the industry really struggle with it still. Um, puppets are one of the worst ones, in fact, if you wanted a little bit. Like, the, I don't know how the, how the guys did it, but damn! Dark Crystal, damn! <laughs> they did a great job. Um, so if you want to actually create a paper template, one of the quickest and easiest ways of doing it is getting a load of masking tape or you know, doing your duct tape dummies if anyone's seen those. Um, wrapping yourself in cling film or the part of the body you want to make a, a particular pattern of. Mummifying yourself in some tape, drawing what you want on top of it and seeing how it sits. Cutting the thing off, sticking it on some foam and cutting it out. The only thing I would sort of tell you guys to remember is make sure that you add in extra margins on that because obviously that fits your arm exactly when it's on there. When you, you want it to sit proud or you want it to have some volume to it then you need to add like it usually about 11% to whatever you've just worked out so make the pattern slice 11% bigger. <laughs> don't know why it's 11% but it's usually around about the magic Maths. number. Maths. Ratios. I don't know either. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, Ah, dual support because I'm sensible. So a lot of people in here like Buster Swords and I imagine someone will probably end up making one in the nearish future considering the remake's coming out, looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> so dual cores are a thing, you are allowed to use more than one piece of core. Usually if there's a hole in the middle of the thing, like in the Buster Sword, you can sort of put them out in a V and then bring them back around. Fiberglass is actually really, really good because you can put formers between a thing and then bend it around itself. Um, or alternatively you can dual core it, but it's a, usually a little bit more processed, but it's damn worth it just to have that extra, extra, extra pretty accurate prop. So, also in dual cores or trying to avoid a hole, it's really, really good to make a wood former in that sort of um, context. So you'd need something like a jigsaw to be able to cut out all of your holes. 
I'm really sorry I don't have an example here. Um, I should have bought my keyblade really. Oh well. Um, any questions so far? Does everyone understand what I mean when I say a word former? Do you know? No? Well. Cool. So if so like I've put fiberglass rods in these, so I'm gonna pass these around, right? So you're building the um, foam around the fiberglass rod. And that's basically what you call the former. So everything else is built around this. So when I say a wood former, that is a specifically shaped former that you build the thing across. So if you've got a hole in your thing, then your wood former would be yay wide with the holes cut in the middle. And then everything is built on top of that. Does that make sense? Cool. So that's basically what a former would be, in my lingo anyway. Um, we don't talk to the CNC machine people because that's a whole different thing. <laughs> so, Obviously, depending on what prop you're building, depends on what type of thing you use. Most props are generally straight cores, pretty simple. Sometimes you get the complicated ones with holes in. Um, then you get guns and stuff. So this, this manic looking thing up here, that had six PVC pipe cores, um, all stapled around a slightly bigger PVC pipe core. Um, and it was just all screwed into place and glued within an inch of its life. And that forms the basis for the rest of the gun. And then you build the foam around it. So very simple pretty quick to produce. Um, what I'd tell you guys to do straight away with whatever you're doing is that you'll notice on these ones, um, the fiberglass rod, if you touch it, is rough. Normally when you get fiberglass rod and stuff from the manufacturers, it will be completely plumb smooth. So that's for a reason. That's so your glue can grab into the fiberglass and really, really hold it on. I think I get to talk about glue in a second. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> oh no, scaling and template making. No. <laughs> So, scaling is a super, Sorry. super fun art. The fiberglass, do you just go over it with a sandpaper or something? Yes, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that. Glue is a science, and I love it. <laughs> so, um, scaling and template making. It's really difficult in cosplay because all the characters have cartoony proportions to work out what scale you're going to create your thing to. Generally, if you want to create something that looks accurate, you want to scale it to your head size. And that gets really confusing really quickly because then you get characters where their bodies are like eh, and their heads are eh, you know, and it's, it's just very confusing very quickly. So if you want a very quick rule, is take the measurement of your head and the measurement of your character's head and then work out your weapon measurement from there. So does everyone know roughly how to do ratios? Or how yeah. ratio scales work? So <laughs> I cheese. use the internet to do it, but yeah. Yeah, no, internet's fine. I, I'm absolutely shit at maths. Most people in my job cannot maths for their lives, so everyone is on the calculators, tearing their hair out, it's a thing. Um, generally, if you're not sure, it's better to, to try and do a little bit of maths, but if you can't work it out, print the dang thing out and then hold it up. Because very regularly, even if you try and work out the ratio, when you print the thing out and then you hold it up to yourself, it still doesn't look right. So it's all about playing with it until it feels correct to your costume or to whatever you're creating. Because I do a lot of 3D printing, I'm usually working with software, so I tend to like, I'll import the, if I'm scaling it to a body or something, which is, I'm going to try it with the head in the future, but I'll like, I'll import the body and the weapon and I'll put something that's my scale in and then I'll just scale it up until it matches that, what that'll do. Brilliant. That works. <laughs> Good on you, that's, that really works. Usually what happens with 3D print programs as well is because it gets imported and exported through three different sets of programs mm. and then the program has its own scale factor and then that gets super confusing because then it ends up this big and you're all like, that is not a helmet. <laughs> that, that is a pinky finger. <laughs> My problem is when I send it to um, a printer and the model has just randomly rotated itself. Ben, yes, it happens all, all the time and it's so frustrating and I, I can tell you it gets worse when you start scaling up the machine to CNC level and then you've got like an engineered part made out of metal that's rotated itself like 180 <laughs> degrees and you're all like, why is it cutting it like that? And then you look at the computer and realise the entire thing's upside down. <laughs> I've seen many, many engineers just walk out like... <laughs> Um, the reason why I've put my, my creepy ogre face in there as well is that one of the other things you can work out is like face plates and stuff by actually using or sculpting something and then taking a masking tape mould of it so you can convert that into a flat paper template and use it from there. So the sculpting, I've done stuff like that where you've actually created a mask out of like paper mache almost exactly the same by using that paper template method. It's really, really useful. One of the other things you can do is actually sculpt a little body, so you sculpt the armour on it take the masking tape thing, and then blow the entire thing up until it's U-sized. So it's a really, really quick, quick way of making really complex armor go from itty-bitty to really big. Um, would recommend. 
oh man, that is not a good picture of me. Yeah. Um, so that's a keyblade on the end, if no one can see that. Not sure you can. Um, again, that's quite a complex box now. So that was about five different fiberglass doors all in a box, and then made sure they were jerry rigged together with various doors and fiberglass. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, so one of the main things that we often run into as cosplayers is, God damn, why do they put so many spikes on it? <laughs> right? Final Fantasy XIV, guys. Fanfest is coming up. Screaming into the void is going to start. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah? Yeah? Oh, yes. Okay. So one of the things that I use quite a lot here is using um, straight rods to create the former, and then actually adding stuff um, as another base. So this guy's got a leather former in him. Um, and that basically stops this from being too floppy and flexible, because obviously it would be like that axe over there if, uh, if I hadn't put anything in there. And then when you laminate it up, it creates rigidity. You say leather for me. You got it, leather. Well, what kind of leather? What so, you, you know, really thick cowhide that they used to make medieval armor out of? Yeah. Uh, I make quite a lot of medieval armor as well, so... <laughs> But there's loads of different stuff you can use if you've got like any flexible plastics. Um, I used to use old cut up Tupperware quite a lot. That's really good. Again, flexible. Um, what you do want to do though is if you've got anything like a Dremel and you're using flat plastic base, you want to try and countersink it into whatever you're um, working with. So if you're working with PVC pipe, cut a hole, try and slide it through, make sure it's nice and sturdy and it's not going to go anywhere. That, any more questions? Just hold on this bit. No, sweet. Cool. Um, so you'll see on here I've used like these bits up here are uh, the leather L's and that, that's created a rigidity for the main keyblade. You'll notice there's a fuck ton of tape on here as well. Tape or any internal structure like fabrics etc creates a greater sense of rigidity and also helps all of your layers adhere together and that stops everything from peeling apart. <laughs> So the way I usually work that is with contact adhesive glue in a minute, promise. Oh wait, insert over eager rant about the V2 blue right here. <laughs> okay, right, this is your friend. His name is contact adhesive. Who can tell me how he works? You spread it in there on both sides. Leave it for five minutes and slam them together. That is the one, you, that is exactly <laughs> what you do. Um, you actually do the same with the spray on stuff. So you'd spray both sides. Wait till it becomes touch dry. Usually, what I do is use the back of my hand because the front of my hands, and I do that, and then they stick, and I'm like, eh. um, <laughs> <laughs> So basically, what you want to do is just touch it with the back of your hand. If it feels wet, the glue is not ready. If it feels dry, it is time. Who can tell me what the basic fundamental principle of glue is, students? Great, because I like talking about it. It shrinks. <laughs> Sorry. It shrinks a bit. It does shrink a bit. That's not the fundamental okay. principle, though. So the fundamental principle of glue and why your glue may or may not work is surface area. Yeah. Everything is down to it's surface so area down. and friction. So the way all glues work and why hot glue is not actually a glue, science, is uh, <laughs> <laughs> that it's made of a solvent, which is why the thing smells and why it dries. So the solvent is the bit that keeps it runny when you're spreading it. It's made of the actual glue itself, which is usually plastic based. Um, believe it or not, contact adhesive is latex based. So if you come out in a reaction with it, that's probably why. Um, and then there's usually forms and fillers which stop it from going moldy and various other things. So it's usually those three parts. The third part, eh. The, the, the second part with the solvent means that you can basically make the glue thinner or thicker, depending on how you want it to spread. So contact adhesive, usually you can make this stuff thinner with a chemical called toluene. If you are using toluene, have a mask. It's the stuff they use to thin diesel. I thought they, okay. I thought they didn't use toluene. Oh, they use toluene. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's, there's quite a few chemicals that sound like toluene as well. Yeah. So one did get discontinued, but several companies still make it, and I can still buy it on eBay. So. <laughs> so is the standard Evo stick still got toluene? Uh, Standard Evo stick is almost exactly the same chemically as every other contact yeah. adhesive. It's just the extra fillers they put in it. There's very, very little difference contact adhesive to contact adhesive. And if you know how to thin it down, you can create the, the style of contact adhesive you like. Wix is really good because, as you can hear, it's quite runny. Um, I prefer my glue runny and thin because, obviously, we like those two thin layers and it builds up really nicely. There's another reason. I'll come back to that later. So when you are gluing anything, prepare your surfaces. Do that with some sandpaper. Rub both edges uh, or surfaces or whatever you're gluing together. 
um, make sure that there's a really nice rough surface that's bitten into with the sandpaper. I, on phones like this, I usually use an 80 grade sandpaper, really nice and rough. Go at it, don't be afraid to punish it. Um, let it call you daddy, whatever you want. <laughs> um, also, if you're struggling with like particularly difficult areas, do feel free to make your own tools. This is just a paper, like a kitchen roll tube with a bit of sandpaper wrapped around it. So that's for sanding circular forms. Um, works really, really well. There's lots of different types of sanding blocks you can buy as well. Um, <laughs> anyway, so make sure that you've prepped the surface. It's really, really important. If your surface isn't clean, try and do a little bit of research into what solvent goes into what thing. Foams generally, because it's all foam dust, you can just go pedal to the metal with the contact adhesive. Super duper easy. You don't have to worry too much about cleaning the surface up perfectly because it all sticks together. Super, super easy. Um, when I say that the primary... I'm going to finish this, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they are really addictive. Um, so when I say the primary concept of glue is that surface area, the sandpaper is maximising the surface area by running divots into it, yeah? And the more grab holes you have, the better your join is. So sandwiches like in this guy were sanded within an inch of his life because this is going to either an actor or to me in the LARP field and I know what I'm like, so... Basically, you want it to be absolutely bomb-proof. Um, if you're not too worried about using it in a sort of full-contact scenario, then you don't need to go pedal to the metal with the glue, but I personally would because you want your prop to last, you want to be proud of it. And that's, it's a good thing, be, be proud of your work. Make sure that you do max that surface area out, make sure you do let the solvent release. I would definitely, definitely recommend contact adhesive for the main reason that most of the foam props that I would be making, the solvent can't escape when you actually create that sandwich between the two foam sections. So contact is the best because it lets most of the solvent out and the little bit that's left just has enough time to reactivate each other's surface to get it to stick together properly. Um, you can do all sorts of fun things. If you are you know, doing subtractive carving, as in you're taking a section of sculpt away, um, as in doing like a blade piece and you go wrong, this stuff's really good. Just stick whatever you've done wrong back on. <laughs> it, it will still carve exactly the same as long as you've got a nice sharp blade. Okay? So, um, I quite regularly make throwing rocks. Um, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, but also, I was hitting them uh, for the sleeves. Um, <laughs> is it better to seal the foam or not? Because there's sort of two different factors when the foam soaks it in too much. That would be it. So, the, the answer to that is it depends what type of foam you're using. So, just as a really quick primer, this stuff is called LD40. This is a really standard foam that you can pick up in most foam factories and that will go right the way through up to stuff like LD120, which is dense as all get out, and you won't be able to move it. So it's all packaging foam. When they say seal it, they're talking about this kind of foam, which is upholstery or unarticulated, yeah? So if you're looking to seal stuff, there's a really, really quick way if you want a super squishy tentacle-like appendage somewhere, maybe a tail or something. Um, this would probably already make quite a good tail, I think. Maybe a horn. Um, what the quickest way to seal it with is actually the spray stuff, because the spray stuff doesn't sink in. So, you know, nice and nice and further back, spray around the thing. You'll get a really, really, I think this, this has actually already been um, glued, so this is technically already glue sealed. So just to show you. Um, so if, if you've got an open cell foam, like that one is, then the glue will sink in, and you won't be able to do a huge amount with it, and it will be really, really heavy and really cumbersome. So use your spray contact if you guys can on the open cell phone. Um, if you wouldn't mind passing that around so people can feel it. Um, I, don't, I don't even know why I bought that, but I'm so glad it's useful. Um, and then you get foams like this, which isn't technically a foam, like this is more like a neoprene based foam. It's just got a long chemical number as opposed to being an actual um, product, for instance. But it's really, really thick. And uh, it almost, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I've used that for like quite close to the the skin on the side. Yeah, um, and obviously all of these foams you can get in all sorts of different thicknesses. What's going on? What, what, what's that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Emily's getting cranked. <laughs> yeah, you had so a foam on your head for about a minute or so. Generally, the types of foams that you're looking for are stuff like Plasterzote, um, 
for the most part, if you type in stuff like LD40, it will come up with the phones that I generally use. Um, except the trouble is what I generally do is I turn up at the factory go, oh, you've got a lot of uh, foam loaf tops, can I just steal them all? And usually the factory guys are all like, yeah, we need to get rid of them. So I end up walking away with the van for them. Um, but I do recommend if you guys live near any foam factories to do that, because normally they're super nice people and they like you testing out stuff. Uh, the guys that, I think it's Cosplay Forge? I used to go to the same factory where they got their foam from and I got all of their loaf off cuts, which was really great. So uh, that's that. It's not packaging foam, but there's a place in Glasgow called the Foam Factory, and I made my recent costume with it. I just went in, do you have any little outfits? They literally just gave me like two bin yeah. bags of stuff they were about to resell. I said, anything you can carry, you can take. Yeah, they're desperate <laughs> to get rid of stuff. Same with if you go to fiberglass manufacturers, usually they've got offcuts of the rods and carbon fiber rods and stuff like that. You can do this stuff really cheaply. I didn't spend any money on this prop, literally zero. Um, I didn't even spend money on the paint. So basically, you can do all of this stuff really cheaply. All of the techniques are very, very accessible that I'm talking about here. But yeah, the, you're right, the factories will just throw stuff at you because they, they can't get rid of it fast it's enough. All the offcuts, they just can't shift. Um, when, by the way, foam is baked like bread, if no one's ever seen how it's made. You wouldn't think so, but it is. Um, they stick it in a giant pressure cooker, and then it rises, and it ends up with like a top bit on it. So you can see on some sides of the foam, and I don't think I even have this one before. But usually it's got like a really high, shiny edge. So when they, they have to cut the top and bottom off, um, and usually the tops and bottoms are still very usable because we still have to like scrape into them with sandpaper, and those are the bits that you'd be given away. So there's a company that called Temporary Supplies, <coughs> if anyone's heard of them? That's awesome. Yeah, they do top and bottom foam loaves, super, super good, quite cheap, um, and there's functionally no difference to, to normal foam. So if you want to do it nice and cheaply, go for stuff like that. Any questions while I'm on the foam part? Sorry, what, what was the... What was this one again? Uh, so that one's actually a neoprene-based one. Um, I would recommend that sort of thing for something that you're going to cover with fabric, so armor pieces. It's really Especially satisfying. Especially armor pieces that are in um, sort of high stress points, so under arms, knees. No, oh, for, the, for the rest of the armor, that's really heavy, isn't it? No, you'd be surprised. Um, we made a Samus suit quite recently out of that stuff, and um, it kind of feels like you're in a scuba suit, I guess. So there's, it's like high pressure, but it's not uncomfortable. So generally, like. Weight with cosplayers, I found, tends not to be as much of an issue as the look. So the fact that you're already working with foam, you're already doing better than quite a few other people. Because the amount of paper mache armors I've seen, and they're all like, oh, it's going to be so lightweight. That's not the way that works. <laughs> you know? So much glue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quick, quick basis on warbler. I don't mind warbler. It's good for certain things. It's a thermoplastic. Thermoplastics are lovely. Uh, the thermoplastic I use is this stuff that goes like frog spawn in hot water, not warbler. Uh, warbler's good for stuff like jewellery if you can't get access to the real metal things. Um, and basically the reason why I hate it is that it is a project product that's horrendously expensive and is trying to imitate a professional finish in a way that is completely terrible and is really bad for the environment and also takes hours. So effectively what Warp is trying to do is trying to imitate um, vacuum forming thermoplastics. So if, if you've never seen vacuum forming, you create a mold for a thing, you stick the plastic over the thing, you heat the plastic, and then you use a vacuum to pull the plastic over a particular fold shape. Look it up, really cool. Um, but that is what Warbler's trying to imitate and not doing a very good job of, basically. I don't mind it, but it's not, you know, I can build a vac former, so I might as well have a vac former, you know? Um, and effectively, Warbler is now also, I believe their clear stuff is the stuff that you'd use in a vac former anyway. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't hate it, I just, why is, why? <laughs> <laughs> cool, any more questions about glue? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, for, like, the, for say like that upholstery foam, you sprayed yes. the glue to seal it. Yes. How would you then, I don't, for like a bit, okay, cover it and, so cool. that wasn't fabric or like cool. if you needed it to be like a, if it's leather or something. If it's okay, I'm gonna get to that. We go. I'm going from start to finish on the prop, and I know okay. if I get if I get sidetracked now, then it's okay. Bottom. Um, <laughs> the problem with the glue that you can put to tell everyone, what which is super glue for cuts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So super glue was invented by the Nazis 
uh, to try and stitch up soldiers on the battlefield. It is predominantly made for sticking you back together, not for sticking stuff together. So that's the reason why it sticks like shit to you and not to anything else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so generally, I love super glue. Remember, it is not for flexible stuff unless it's your skin. It doesn't work very well on flexible props. It crystallizes. It's kind of a pain in the ass to scrape back off once you put it on there. So if you can avoid using super glue with flexible props, if you're using plastic props, uh, it sticks quite well to metal in some cases. You can get kicker for it. If no one's used super glue kicker, definitely wear a mask for that. It's one of the most poisonous substances you can find in a house. Um, but that basically means that you can put super glue on both things you're trying to glue, spray a little bit of kicker, slap them both together, and it glues instantly. Really lovely stuff, you especially if you're on the baking powder. Baking powder does also work, yeah. Um, it's a little bit messier is the other <coughs> thing. Uh, and it's a, it's a lot better for you, so if you can use baking powder, use baking powder. Cool. Um, I, did, sorry, my love, did you have your hand up just now? No. no? Cool, just checking. Cool. Um, super glue, yeah. Really good stuff, perhaps not for foam. No. Um, there are other glues you can use on foam. You can technically use PVA, but remember if you stick it in a sandwich of foam, it's not going to dry, ever. Um, but it's, it can be used to seal it. I don't personally like it because, again, it will crack eventually. There are additives you can get to make it really, really flexible, and like latex or rubber. Um, so experiment with those if you want to try it out, if you want to try and find something cheaper to finish your items with. Um, PVA also has a really bad habit of sinking into open cell foam, and it will make whatever you're working on really, really heavy and a lot more rigid than you want it to be. So um, I've seen a lot of people recommend using it as a sealer for open stuff. Please don't do that. Yeah, I can contest that I made a giant tip prop, tried to use PVA glue, it did yeah. not work out. Yeah. So in fact, actually the same way that I build the small rock is the way I build the big rock. So I'm about to take you through exactly what I do. Um, cool. <laughs> I've got hot glue, hot wire, and hot dam on there. <laughs> so, scalpels and exacto knives. These are the best things you can own for any form of crafting, and I love all of my children dearly. You can get a lot of different shapes, a lot of different blade sizes. Personally, I recommend the four handle with a 26 blade because it's lethal and I love it. <laughs> Um, exacto knives are also really, really good. You can self sharpen them as well, so if you're quite cheap like I am, you can use really fine sandpaper and run the scalpel blade back and forward up them. Um, you don't need to, you can buy really, really cheap, decent um, exacto and Stanley blades as well as relatively cheap scalpel blades now. I think it's 10 quid for 100, and it takes me a long time to get through 100 of them. So there's Swan Morton. Swan Morton is easily the best. Um, Unfortunately, if you take the Chinese knockoff ones, they tend to have probably about 25% of the pack that's already blunt before you can put them in the scalpel hand, <laughs> uh, which we don't like. We like sharp scalpel blades. Sheffield steel. Sorry? Sheffield steel. Who knows? Who knows? Well, there's a Swan Morton factory in Sheffield. Yeah, it? it's, it's got to be the best or nothing for me now. I can't go back. It's been a gateway drug this whole time. <laughs> so, if you are struggling to cut a thing, stick a new blade on your scalpel. It is as simple as that. If you are getting a bad cut result, it is probably not you, it is probably your blade. Um, I know that's relatively easy for me to say, but it's true. <laughs> so, one of the other things that a lot of people do is that they think they should be able to freehand and draw with these things. Um, I still can't very well, kind of, not really. So it's really, really useful just to make sure that you do have that super sharp blade and that you're using rulers, etc. It should be that easy. Yeah. If anyone wants to try this... Be that is guest. so satisfying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 do you want to go? Yeah, so the... Oh. Careful! Oh. That would not be the first time. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I've actually got quite a big scar on my leg where I was pushing it, like leaning on my leg and didn't realise the scalpel had fallen off the table. And I cut myself and not realised, and Andy walked up and just went... <laughs> <laughs> not sure whether to say about happy lady time or not. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so if anyone wants to go with this, anybody? Please yeah. be super careful. Um, obviously, I'm I didn't bring a cutting mat because I'm a doof canoe. So uh, <laughs> if you could do it in the air, I know that's a pain yeah, in the jack. Yeah, yeah. Um, does anyone else want to go? Because I have more foam and more scalpel. No, what's in the bottle? Sorry? What's in the bottle? Gin and tonic gummies. What's in the bottle? Oh, oh. 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 oh.
Usually what I do, you push the tag at the bottom, okay. yeah? So it's this little bit, and then just yank the entire thing out. Yeah, because my handle, um, it's got sort of the sandwich style, so it's basically I can't really push the tag out of so it's like I have sort of really weird Yeah, get yourself a swan long handle, they're like four quid. So yeah. I think my one is a swan long, I think it's just a different one. It could, be, it could be an old one. So yeah. they do, they do um, like model making sandwich scalpels where you've got a lot of movement, fine movement in the blade, and you can't have that, so the sandwich stuff kind of eliminates that wall. Yeah, so that's um, no, But you wouldn't need that for cosplay because you're not working right. with stuff that's half a millimetre thick, you know? Okay. So uh, who, who put the hand up? You, so. Cool. Yeah, okay, my scalpel boys. Um, let's give you a big bit. Right, this is all scrap stuff. I've got fucking millions and horrible amounts of it, so please use it to your heart's content. Go, play. Frolic, my pretty. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you can have to wait for Emily. I do have one question about that. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. If you've got some small enough to end, still put it on. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a few minutes. Generally, I think what you're basically asking okay. is how can I, is it this sort of size? Yeah, yeah, so if you've got something big and say for example you wanted to do the runes. Yeah. And do it. So, generally, because this has got a flat back, it's much easier to carve it. Yes, I'm super good. It rests relatively flat on your work. Alternatively, because this is all sandwich foam, it's all made out of layers and layers and layers built. There we go, we got hair! Something like that carving the rooms, you're not slicing all the way through. Exactly. That's how you form a sandwich dagger, yeah? So that's three layers. So obviously we have something like rod with yeah. a thing in it. So what you can actually do with the sandwich method, so you can do a roll if you want if you want like a perfectly cylindrical thing around a centerpiece, then you can roll the front around and turning around and feathering the edge off. You don't play straight. But with that you can do the three sandwich method, and that means that you can get two flat outer edges of hand and all your detail carving before you can glue them together. Yeah, you can you can pick up the hand really really like hundred. Super, super cool. Um, cool. Any more questions just while I'm here? Yeah, you have 20 oh, so minutes there, though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, I've got Dice Chan on here. That's so cool. Anyway, um, guns, similar stuff. You can do all of the sculpting and details really, really nice and easily. Um, I use a hell of a lot of hot glue on mine, even on my LARP weapons, because by the time you put the foam back into it, they press into the foam really nicely, and it's actually not very dangerous to have them on there. So doing like little rivet heads, just with a little dollop of hot glue, swirling it around a bit, you can create some really interesting effects. Veining is quite nice to do with some hot glue. Um, again, hot glue's not a glue, so make sure it's, you know, you've actually put glue down. Or you could, um, if you do hot glue on plastic, you can then peel it off and put it on your thing and glue it properly. One of, one of the tools that is well worth investment is a glue gun that isn't shit. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Bosch do really good ones, and if you want the personal mother load of all glue guns, visit 3M because they do this horrible orange invention and it's. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so that one is hot enough to melt the plastic underneath and lets the hot glue actually grab like actual glue wood. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's good shit. Um, yeah, where was I? Hot wire works quite well on foam, but it's not particularly accurate, so if you want quite a rough, like, outward rugged appearance, it's quite good for making natural scenery like rocks. Loads and loads of people use it on polystyrene for making, like, warhammer sculptures and stuff like that. Hot wire's great. Um, again, be super careful with it. It can take off your thumb. I have seen it. It was not a good day. Um, one of the other things, again, is making uh, specialised tools, so at this stage is where I'd be using one of these the most. You can also create really good foam hole cutters, so a lot of things that people struggle with is getting that perfect diameter hole. So if you've got a little bit of metal pipe at home somewhere, use a bit of metal pipe, sharpen the edge using a sander, and then just twist it through the foam, and it will create a perfect diameter hole. You get some really lovely clean edges. It's, it's a nice, super, super good thing. That one is really satisfying. If you think the scalpels are satisfying, just being able to go, eh, <laughs> great. Um, yeah, again, one of the other things you can remember is that hot tools are your friends. So stuff like hot knives, 
and also soldering iron. So the runes on this were actually done with a soldering iron and a scalpel. Um, soldering irons, you tend to get a little bit of a messier effect and it tends to stutter a bit. Uh, and also, if you've not got a very steady hand, it's probably something to avoid because at least with the scalpel, it's easy to glue it back in. Whereas once you've got the heat form um, plastic on the outside, because you'll notice the texture of plastic changes when you heat treat it and it stops it from grabbing as well. So uh, you ideally want to try and keep to scalpel if you can, but if you're confident, play with hot tools. Um, soldering irons, I think at the moment, are £7 on Amazon. Mm -hmm. There's no point in spending money on it because you're going to gum it up really quickly, but they're, they're a really nice cheap tool to just have when you're playing with foam, and you can write in them like you would with a pen. Just don't grab the pot bit like a pen. I did that one. Yes. Oh. It, mine fell off the desk and I went for it and was all like, uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of photos on Facebook about that. Yeah. So, when's your panel entirely on horror stories from you injuring yourself? Kitakon! <laughs> <laughs> Me and Katie have planned it, and yes, the sandwiches in there, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Katie, you're not allowed to eat sandwiches. Yeah, I'm 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 not allowed to eat sandwiches. Um, yeah, finishing and detailing again, this is all to do with stuff that I've just gone through and forgot to move the panel on for. Um, tester pieces. If you are not confident in doing what you're doing, make some testers. This stuff is all relatively cheap, and if you haven't got like a, a sort of um, expendable income, uh, I usually go dumpster diving, because you can pull out some really, really good cosplay materials and complete if an entire cosplay from no money. Big secret. Talk to reupholsterers. Yeah. Um, they end up with a lot of leather on cuts. They end up with a lot of leather, um, yeah. left like leather that has come off sofas and is going straight in the bin. Yeah. And, leather, and they end up with an awful lot of foam off cuts and waste foam from yeah. old sofas. And leather is one of the best things you can actually finish foam armour in. Uh, it's probably the most underrated method. So a lot of people obviously do the warbler method and then do wood glue, blah, 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 blah. In fact, actually just covering it in leather, so one layer, uh, stretching it. Right. It doesn't have to be upholstery grade, in fact I've made plenty of really, really good, uh, authentic looking um, armours from what is effectively like stretch pleather. Uh, stretch works really, really well, because you know like, when you bend the foam back the opposite way it gets that dimpling effect. Because obviously like, you've got two different things and they're trying to pull away from one another all the time, that's just the way glue works. But um, if you use stretch um, fabrics to cover your armour in, it also means that your paint will never scratch. So really, really, really good, quick, and relatively cheap way of finishing off very impressive props. I've seen a lot of people do some really cool stuff with it. And then of course, because most fabric still has a grain in top, and the glue will sink into it, you can then glue more foam on top. So there's no real reason why you can't keep creating a bigger sandwich of, of foam and fabric. Um, textures. A lot of people in cosplay especially seem to be a little bit texture phobic. Don't be afraid of sand, is what I'm saying. You can do a lot of really cool stuff with actual bark and leaves and just really experiment with all sorts of stuff. Because once you've mummified the kit in your contact adhesive, you'll have a really interesting piece and it will have some really lifelike cool textures with it. So if you're into any game models and creating stuff, so like fun fancy stuff, I know there's a lot of texture with crystals and things like that, you can create some really, really interesting textures by like layering the foam in specific ways and then using like bits of bark for instance. Um, a lot of people ignore that particular facet of it and try and create like this super clean cartoony thing but often the best cosplayers I've ever seen are the ones that have really really used texture and gone to town with their experimentations and how they like the thing to look because it, it just grounds whatever you're doing in reality as well. So it's like that next level of, of heightened cosplay goodness. So I would really, really recommend that if you can. Um, does everyone know what I mean when I say additive or subtractive sculpting? So obviously additive is you glue a new thing to it, you've added something to it, subtractive is you've taken something away. Um, generally with foam, you're doing both, which so this is really good practice for anyone who wants to start doing like actual fiddly sculpting, traditional sculpting so to speak. So um, if you're looking to maybe go that way and stop doing moulding and casting, this is also a good place to start because it gets you your brain working out layers and stuff in a 3D format. Um, who is interested in moulding and casting? Just out of curiosity. Cool. Might, might do a pro panel. Pram? Panel. Mm -hmm. Panel on that one day. So um, there's 50 million different ways you can do it. <laughs> cool. Um, I put on here and it's a bit late, but research. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so if, if you don't know, or if you're unsure of how you're going to do it or how you're working, just keep researching it until you feel confident that, hey, I kind of know how I want to I tackle this. And then if you've done the research and you're still not sure, just fucking try it anyway, because why the hell not, you know? That's where most people, when they're in the prop making industry, start out. It's just, we'll throw this at a wall and if it sticks, then great, and if it doesn't, then we'll try again. Have fun with it. It is all about just that puerile, playful experimentation at the end of the day. And also, you don't have to finish your cosplay. You can be proud with just a couple of sections of armor. That is okay. You are still worthwhile. You can still buy your costumes. No one gives a fuck. Yay, all my unfinished cosplays. <laughs> you did it. You fucking made an effort. That's awesome. I'm telling you about Oh, planning and painting. Cool. Here we are. We've arrived. Cool. Flexible paint, right? Uh, if you have... <coughs> Well, that's why that hurt. Um, if you have a flexible prop, you want to finish it in flexible paint, primers, etc., etc. Loads of people get to this warbler stage or the foam stage. I'm, I'm because you've mentioned it to me before. Not you specifically, because I know you haven't done it. You, you're a good boy. <laughs> a lot of people don't know or don't have that logical progression that if you're making a flexible prop, make the paint and the finishes flexible. And a lot of people will look at me and be like, what's flexible paint? Well, the answer to that is, unfortunately, if you've got allergies, latex. <laughs> latex is wonderful. If you don't use it, you should be. It's Unless you have an allergy. No, so most people only have the skin allergies. Mm -hmm. I've never met anyone thus far who's like part of the 0.02% of people who can't breathe the yeah, ammonia. And it relaxes. So it's the ammonia that uh, generally yeah. people can be allergic to for the breathing thing. Yeah. Um, by that point, you know, you can't use half the products on this table, so, um, yeah. Generally, if you're wearing gloves and you've got a latex allergy, you should be fine. Just make sure that you're not, you know, you, you've not got too much skin showing anywhere. And um, they're not latex gloves. Sorry? As if and they're not latex gloves. Yeah, nip control, <laughs> control, please, 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 please. please. Um, so, one of the quickest ways of explaining this to you is that glue and paint are fundamentally the same thing. One has pigment, one does not. That is the only difference between the two. So this is not just glue, it's a primer. <laughs> so this guy was finished with this, right? That's the primer I used on this axe, on all of these love weapons. Just more glue, thin down. It is really that simple. And primers are super good because it stops your paint from chipping, everything grabs really nicely. Like latex normally you'd be able to peel off, but I can't get hold of this stuff anywhere. Um, it's super, super good to thin the stuff down before you use it, the primer, because it does tend to get a bit stringy and a bit cobwebby. But again, really simple, really quick. Stick some extra toluene in it if you have any, or buy the really liquid stuff because it's great. And um, then use that as your priming piece. So brush it on. You can. Um, with this stuff, if you want to keep reusing your brushes, then you would want toluene. Um, if you want to paint in latex, and you want to save your brushes, because it will gum up your brushes, something chronic, is just dip your brush in a little bit of fairy liquid and water. And then you can use the same brush for all eternity. Mm. And it's great. So, generally, what I do with this stuff, you paint that on, leave that to dry, make sure it isn't, hasn't got any wet patches on it, um, sometimes it will form bubbles because there's still bubbles trapped in the foam. The really easy way of getting rid of it is just rubbing over the top and all the bubbles pop. Really simple, really quick. Um, then usually what I do is that I mix my latex up with acrylic paint. Usually do a black base or a few black bases um, or whatever priming colour you want. So sometimes gold you want to prime in like blue or green to try and create that really nice um, twangy colour. So. <laughs> It's a word. Uh, <laughs> and then basically layer up the different colours on top. So usually I go blue or green, copper, and then the full gold whack at the end. And it creates a really nice depth of metal that makes the prop look really um, like 3D and vibrant. Uh, I unfortunately air gun my stuff, so I'm sort of cheating a little bit. But one of the best ways to apply this kit is actually with a sponge. So you don't even really need brushes a lot of the time. Um, or even if you've got a load of pieces of scrap foam, actually brushing it on with scrap foam to create that really nice smooth rounded edge. So on edges like that, it's super easy to just pull the latex over it. Uh, the other thing that you can do with this stuff as well is that you can mix it with various glitters and things like that. 
and then apply it in layers so you can really, because latex is slightly translucent, if you use a small amount of pigment in it and then build it up in layers, you can create something that looks like quite galaxy-like. Like this? Then, like that. Because that seems that's, to have That's got a lot of glitter in it. Um, yeah. So then there are also on the market things like flexible um, priming rubbers, which I tend to use on the outside of my weapons. So there's something called Isoflex Primer Clear. That's what most Oh, I love that with. stuff. It smells for years. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. It does have a habit of sticking to everything during the first week. So if you've, if you've got any lube at home... You <laughs> <laughs> use, like, silicon lube as well, like... Bugs. Well, I mean, most lube is silicon these days, so, yeah, yeah generally it, it works a treat. Um, <laughs> technically, WD-40 works as well, but if you put spray paint on the outside of your latex, then... What's the best way to apply it? I mean, my friend once covered one of his uh, weapons and just let it drip dry. Oh, <laughs> no. so, I, I mean, the result wasn't too bad, but it was quite a thick coating on it. Yeah, it does, it does end up... Oh, no, 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 that was fine. There, there wasn't anything, but it was just... There was so much of it. So with Isoflex or Covent, Covent Garden, sealers, primers, whatever you're using for your top coat, if you want gloss or matte, Generally, you do not want to let it drip because mm. you will end up with drip marks everywhere and they go quite yellow as well. Mm. They, if you put any top spray on, they'll also collect the spray paint on the way down so you end up with these nice long tear marks. It's really annoying. So the best way of doing it actually is to swabble your brush about in a pot of it, brush as much as you can of it out onto like a, a palette or something like yeah. that and then brush it on as thinly as possible and just do it in a lot of layers. Um, I generally only do mine in one now because I've gotten used to the stuff but it's yeah. really weirdly runny so it's very easy for it to get away with you and you've got to check up on it quite regularly yeah. so my answer to that is use as, as little as possible as often as possible fair enough um speaking of layers how many of layers how many layers of latex do you tend to use to coat uh, when I'm spraying I use two or three so if you've got an air gun at home I don't know maybe you might um, then two or three should be fine um, there's usually a mixture that I use to help it apply a bit better. Yeah. If I imagine most of you will be sponging it on or brushing it on at home. So um, what I'd say is you're probably looking for a cosplay weapon. Maybe three coats, probably. If you want to go up to LARP, I'd say go go pedal to the metal and go really high with it because like the, the more you've got, the longer the weapon will last for, especially when you've got like pointy edges on it. Yeah. So um, yeah, generally, the more the better. I think you're probably topping out at about 12 where you start to lose detail Yeah. if you're doing it in a, a sort of nice way. Also cross hatching, so if you've, if you've brushed it on vertically, if your next layer is horizontal you end up with a much smoother finish. And invest in a nice brush for it. Time? Time. Five minutes. Um, yeah, similar with any of uh, armour pieces, if you can lay them flat, brush it on, horizontal, vertical brush legs, mm. easy peasy. With it. You can do some really, really cool stuff with it. Um, that mask is all of these weapons and stuff are done exactly the same way. Um, and that's how I build props. Hey. Yay! Yay.